It is the Caribbean Football Weekly Podcast, Episode 10, Season 1, the finale. I'm Simon Preston and joined alongside my co-presenters Nathan Carr, home of Caribbean Football founder, and Santoki Nagalendron, a football aficionado and also an expert on Caribbean football and all football in general. Gentlemen, how are you all doing, Nathan? Yeah, very well, thank you. I'm, I'm guessing that, Simon, you're still in, uh, in recovery mode after Friday night. <laughs> Uh, definitely still in that mode. Santoki, how are you? I'm great. I'm great, Simon. Great to be back on the show and looking forward to discussing the football which took place over the weekend. Absolutely. We had quite a bit of action. I'm still trying to recover from that whammy from Friday night, as you all could see from the channel on the Reggae Boys commentary. I was very irate about the performance. However, we have to move forward. We can't change the past. But we did have some news happening before we get into the World Cup qualifiers. Nathan, do you want to kick us off about things happening around the region? Yeah, there's actually quite a bit of um, quite a bit of news this week. So just to kick you off with a, a transfer that's just taken place tonight, um, Benner Boys striker Dexter Blackstock has signed for Rotherham United in the Championship. So that's Ooh. the second division here in England on a free. Um, he was released from Nottingham Forest, so uh, hopefully he'll be playing for Antigua and Barbuda in October's um, final round qualifiers for the Caribbean Cup. Uh, so he has moved to, to Rotherham. Remco Bicentini is the new Curaçao head coach. Uh, he's 48-year-old. He was the assistant to Patrick Cliver. Um, Cliver obviously left and uh, was named director of football at PSG. And Remco Bicentini was his assistant. He's now been named um, the full head coach and he took charge of a friendly, his first game on Thursday against Achilles 29 in Holland. Uh, Just a friendly against that Dutch club and they won 1-0, Gianluca Maria scoring the goal. Um, And just a couple of of friendlies as well that have taken place over the last uh, last few days. Um, Obviously the Dominican Republic played Puerto Rico in what was dubbed the Caribbean Classico, a double header. Um, the Dominic- Dominican Republic won on both occasions. Uh, Nicaragua um, held, uh, well, played uh, St. Kitts and Nevis at home, and um, the Sugar Boys managed to get a draw in that, nil-nil. Uh, so six consecutive clean sheets for them. And finally, um, Puerto Rico travelled to Mumbai to play India, lost 4-1, having gone one nil up through a penalty um, thanks to uh, Manolo Sanchez. Um, I think there was some reports that the Puerto Rican players were a little bit tired having arrived the day before on the Friday. Um, so, yeah, they, they were kind of beating pretty comfortably in the end. Um, and India are, are actually you know lower ranked than them in the FIFA rankings as well. But um, not a desirable result for Puerto Rico, but uh, they'll be, they'll be uh, kind of looking forward to the Caribbean Cup qualifiers now, uh, which are next month. So that's, uh, that's all the news my end. Thanks very much, Nathan. Much appreciated there. Just a little bit of tidbit there on Dexter Blackstock. His first international goal for Antigua came against the United States Mm -hmm. in the 2014 World Cup qualifiers in St. John's, Antigua. Um, Santoki, anything from your side? Um, Just a bit of news from Guyana involving women's football. The Guyana Football Federation have announced over the weekend that they are starting a women's development league so that will be 13 teams from across Guyana to take part in a senior women's league the first of its kind in Guyana which should be really good because at the moment there's no real development of local talent in Guyana and there have been complaints when the senior women's team aka the Lady Jags when they play that it's all overseas players so the majority of the team are born in Canada or the USA so now they're putting into place an infrastructure which should hopefully see women develop to a level where they can compete on an international level so looking forward to that all right thank you very much santoki just a bit of news from my end as well a curacao born player who's at manchester united tahith chong the 16 year old he's actually training with the first team it's quite good news not many teenagers at that age get that sort of opportunity so we wish him all the best i'm not sure if he'll be able to get into the first team this season but being around professionals can always help you develop and also the Red Stripe Premier League in Jamaica is off and underway. As well, we had six matches yesterday and 
the defending champions shockingly lost to Marvelly Huenden 2-1 at the Westpaw Park while Tivoli Gardens they are at the top of the table after a 3-0 victory over Harborview former Jamaican international Jermaine Johnson the 36 year old getting a brace in that encounter quite a remarkable performance that was Portmore United beating newcomers Jamalka 1-0 and also Arnett Gardens they drew 0-0 with Reno and in addition to that my alma mater the University of the West Indies they beat Waterhouse FC 1-0 and finally Humble Lion they beat Boys Town 2-0 so that's match day one of the Red Stripe Premier League in Jamaica quite a lot of you can say euphoria around this sort of season, many expectations around it, what can come out of it. Nathan, I want to ask you a question before we get deeply into the matter as well, in addition to one more story I want to mention. Looking at the different leagues in the Caribbean, bar the Trinidad Pro League, what are your thoughts about the Red Stripe Premier League in Jamaica in terms of the quality of performances and players in the league? Um, I think the fact that it's, it works on a semi-professional basis um, makes it stand out along with Trans Tobago but obviously I can only go off really what I've what I've read and what people tell me and, and, the, and the, the kind of limited highlights that I've seen um, I mean it I think there's there's work that can be done I know that um, somebody was telling me the other day that he thinks um, you know a big Jamaican fan he thinks that maybe there are um, there are too many veteran players in the US strike Premier League and there's an mm. emphasis really on older players when the the needs to you know they need to try and um, bring about the youth uh, and, and try and um, blood through the youngsters a little bit more. Um, I also think as well that I know you know in in, in the late kind of late twentieth century there was quite a lot of fan violence, wasn't there at games? Um, right. There used to be that that kind of culture, which has slowly been eradicated. But you know there's been improvements made on that. I think, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, generally, I think the competition is decent. We've seen that, you know, a team like Mavali Hewen Dunn has uh, has gone and beaten uh, the, the the reigning champions Montego Bay United away as well. Um, so that's a very good result for them. I think players um, coming back to play, like Jermaine Johnson, who's gone out to 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 Europe and gained experience coming back, um, and and kind of passing on the experience that he's he's garnered, um, can only be beneficial. Um, and also, you know, I think it's good when some of the local base players get called up to the national team because then we get to see, I think, it gives us a little insight into the level that the Red Strike Premier League is at. Because when you pit the likes of Domino Solomon or or um, Andrew Vanzi or I think Michael Binns has just got off the island recently, but when he was at Portmore, um, you know, you get to see how they perform and, you know, taking in... To consideration the tempo of games and the fitness etc I think that gives us an insight into the um, into the into how how um, how good the US Drive Premier League is but yeah I think certainly in the Caribbean it's one of the strongest but you look at it within CONCACAF as a whole with it being semi-professional um, I don't think I think it's got some work to do but Simon and, and Santoki you probably have your own opinions on this Santoki, you want to add anything on that? Yeah, um, agree with Nathan. It's, I think in the Caribbean, it's a strong, it's a strong league. It's up there. I don't think it's got as much quality as the TT Pro League, but in terms of like when uh, you have uh, Waterhouse or Montego Bay or Arnett Gardens enter the CFU Championships, they usually win their groups. Um, so there is strong, but I don't think on a Concacaf level, the quality is there. What I am impressed about with the Jamaican League, from what I have seen in highlights, is like the media coverage. Like I've saw, I've seen videos where there's like good commentary, good, uh, good crowds, uh, filming, very good editing. So I think that is something which they better, which is superior to any other league in the Caribbean. But in terms of quality, I think the TT Pro League just edges it. Even though I think Jamaica does have better media coverage of their league and more fan support. Yeah, thanks for your views there. Yes, there has been some improvement over the last three, four years where they've incorporated Monday night football, like what we see in England for for decades now, where the fans are out and with a new sponsor, Red Stripe. And I think the product is quite marketable. We've seen that already. You've made a good point about the terms of the quality of the certain performances, but I think it's a decent benchmark to work with 
although we want to see better pitches involved and youth getting more of an opportunity. I'm quite pleased about, like you said, about the media coverage because once upon a time, you had to wait until it was news time or sports time to get the results of the matches. Now with the social media, you have a Premier League Clubs Association Twitter account and that gives a, a score update every 15 minutes. So you're kept in the loop and we well appreciate that very much so. Now, going into our first bit of business for this evening, before we get into World Cup qualifiers, we're going to touch into a Caribbean team that is going into a FIFA tournament, and that is Cuba. They'll be participating in the FIFA Futsal World Cup in Colombia, which begins on September 10th and will end on October the 1st in Colombia. This is the eighth edition of the FIFA Futsal World Cup, and we look forward to this sort of event. It will be take place in three cities across, well, a number of cities across Colombia, where likes of Bogota, Cali, as well, Nieva, and as well, Medellin. So let's look at Colombia's, sorry, Cuba's group going into this. Nathan, you look at this group with the likes of Thailand, Russia, Egypt. Do you think that Cuba can get out of this group? You look at previous tournaments, they haven't been able to get out of the group stages, but do you think it's an opportunity for them? So it's, it's, it's the top two that go through, is that right? I think it's the top two. The top two go but also the the best third place teams has an opportunity okay. as well. Okay, I mean um, I know that Thailand um, were the hosts for the 2012 uh, Futsal World Cup, um, yeah. but I don't know I don't know too much about them. I've seen Russia once on Eurosport, um, and again Egypt are a bit of an unknown quantity to me. But we know that Cuba finished the semi finalists in May's Concacaf qualifying. Um, I mean, all you, you, they took the, the final four, so as long as you got to the semi-finals, that assured your spot at the Futsal World Cup, which, as you say, is going to be held in Colombia. Starts this Saturday and will last for three weeks. Um, but Cuba were seemingly pretty strong in Caribbean qualifying. They did the job finishing second in their group in CONCACAF qualifying. Um, just for any listeners that aren't aware of what is Futsal, you might, you, you might think. You know, they might not have heard of it before. Um, futsal uses a heavier ball um, on, a, on a smaller pitch, reduced space. I think the, the goals are slightly shorter as well. Um, and the emphasis really is on, on um, being technically proficient, uh, keeping the ball in tight areas, in pressurised situations, um, and basically just keeping the ball on the floor to try and engineer a way past the opposition. So it's very technical. You need very good close ball control. So, um, yeah, Cuba, I'm not too sure on their, on their past history at the Futsal World Cup. I don't think it's been going for a great number of years. As you say, it's the 8th edition. Um, but, I mean, looking at their performances on grass, they do tend to have quite nimble, um, technically good players. Um, so hopefully they can carry that over to, to the Futsal World Cup. If they could get in the top two in their group and progress to the knockout phases, I think that will be a very, very good achievement. Agreed, very much so. Santoki, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with that. I think it would be a big achievement if they did manage to get through. I think in the CONCACAF Championships, they drew 1-1 with Curaçao, then lost to Costa Rica 6-0 before qualifying via a 7-4 victory over Canada. So you wouldn't say they were consistently good in qualifying. They only managed to score eight goals, which is quite a low amount in uh, futsal for three games. So you would say they're the underdogs heading into this group. But again, as Nathan has reiterated, Egypt are un uh, unknown quantity as well. So you don't know how other teams in the group are going to perform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very difficult because in every four years, you sometimes see different teams evolve. And as Nathan pointed out with this sport, it's very difficult to actually make predictions of what teams can do because the gaps are quite small in moving the ball around and just one simple touch can lead the ball into the back of the net. We've seen it so much times. Well, Guatemala seems to be a quite good customer in, in this region, in this sort of tournament as well. Never been to a FIFA World Cup proper, but they've been to a futsal World Cup as well and one of their leading goal scorers in the 11-a-side sort of football, the association football, Carlos Ruiz. He's even played in a FIFA Futsal World Cup. So we do wish Cuba all the best where this is concerned. Now, let's get right into the World Cup qualifiers, which happened on Friday evening. Well, we had quite a number of surprising results. Santoki, Panama against Jamaica. 
just analyzing the result and the performance of the Jamaicans, were you surprised by what you saw? I was I was surprised to a degree, but to a, another degree, it was predictable of their previous performances in the group. Uh, last week, we talked about Jamaica not having a goal goal instinct so far in the groups and being quite sloppy in their performances. And be, while while we weren't optimistic about their chances, I did have a hope inside of me that they would raise their game for this big game, which was essentially a knockout game. Unfortunately, from what I've seen via highlights, um, it seems as if they were sloppy again on the ball and they just lacked that ability to get a striker on the ball and score the crucial goals. And it was a tame exit for them, if I do say so myself. Mm-hmm. Nathan, what do you th- think about that? Quite disappointing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a bit of an anticlimax, to be honest. Um, I mean, yeah, we talked about their their wastefulness in front of goal um, in the previous show. Um, they actually haven't scored a competitive goal now since late March. Um, you know, that was at home to Costa Rica at the office. So, you know, that's a huge problem for them they haven't addressed. I mean, just looking at the team, um, a few questions. I, I, I'm not sure why Adrian Mariapa didn't start. I know that he's been without a club, just signed for Hull City, but I would have had him in person here at right back over somebody like Javon Watson, who showed very obviously at the Copper America Centenario that he is not a defender. Um, I'd have Michael Hector at centre-half along with Wes Morgan, who captained the side on Friday night. I don't think Hector is effective in central midfield than he is at central defender. Um, in, terms of, in, yeah, in terms of the midfield as well, um, Williamson, I think he's a very, very safe average bog standard you could say sort of player um, I don't think he's international class to be perfectly honest and I think some like Omar, Omar Holness or even Rodolf Austin who had had a bit of bite um, would have been a lot better option um, and I know people have said it as well but I mean looking up front is somebody like Caton Donaldson is he really the best that Jamaica have got I know that Darren Mattox was sidelined Deshaun Brown has been snubbed again um, but I personally think that Donaldson will be a good reserve option for Jamaica. But going forward, he 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 can't be the number one choice. He can't. He's getting on now as well. So I think Mattox, when fit, has got to be number one. Um, Deshaun Brown there to challenge. Giles Barnes probably plays a bit more as a number ten. So I think some of the some of the some of the personnel decisions from Schaefer were were questionable against Panama. Um, also, you can look at the preparation for that game. Panama conducted a training camp. As far as I'm aware, they played at least one friendly before that game. Jamaica, on the other hand, you know, I think they had, was it two or three training sessions? I think it was two. Um, it was bad, bad weather um, at the at the at um, one of the training pitches that they, that they trained on beforehand, which probably didn't help them. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, the blame is going to be put on, on Winfrey Schaefer, isn't it? There's reports that he gets paid, you know, an extortionate amount of money. I think it was something like 500000 was it, or um, a, a year. He was hired to take Jamaica to the 2018 World Cup. He, clearly, he and his team have not achieved that objective. So, um, you know, the, 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 if the reports are true about Captain Horace Burrell coming out and saying there might be a change, there might be a switch in the technical leadership, then we might see Schaefer go. Um but you know, yes. If you look at it, if you look at his his uh, his actual record with Jamaica, okay, he won the 2014 Caribbean Cup. He did very very well to lead them to the 2015 Gold Cup. But this this qualifying campaign, there's no doubt about it. It's been so underwhelming. It's been so disappointing going forward. Um, and I think they just they underestimate the opposition and they ultimately they bottled it, Simon. There's very little to disagree with you from what you just said, basically. To answer your question about Agent Mariapa, I was actually speaking to him after the game, and he said coach believed that he lacked a bit of match sharpness. But still, Agent Mariapa has performed for Jamaica 50%, 75%, and I still prefer him over Jermaine Taylor starting for Jamaica. I can say that hands down. The quality that he brings is undoubtedly amazing. Jermaine Taylor was out of football sitting down just because he, when he was in Jamaica for St. George's Sports Club for a little over a year because there was some political disagreement instead of going out and, and finding a club. So that chunk of his year is, is out of his professional football life. 
31 years old now. Look at Adrian Mariapa. He's he's gonna he's still 29. Still has more to offer to Jamaica. Going forward, where does the team go? That is another question. You look at the crop of players that is available. Wes Morgan, 32 is, years of age. Joby McEnough is going to be 35 in November. Clayton Donaldson is 32. Hmm. You have to think to yourself, can you realistically see those players being part of the next walk of qualifying campaign? Realistically speaking, no. But I do see them in the interim, a stopgap, playing in the Gold Cup, perhaps, 2017. Granted, we have to count, it, count the chicks before they're hatched because the Caribbean Cup qualifiers is key and big matches ahead against Guyana and Suriname. However, speaking spe- specifically on the campaign, it has been, as Nathan said, quite underwhelming. Look at the performances. Only two goals scored in the semifinal round of qualifiers. Look how we started the qualifiers against Nicaragua. We were 3 0 down at home to Nicaragua. The last time we were 3 0 down at home was Rene Simois' first match in charge of Jamaica back in 1994 against the United States. You don't come to Jamaica to score three goals on us without us scoring. Nobody does that. Nobody comes and does that to Jamaica. Jamaica, the national stadium, is a fortress. And what has happened over these past couple of years has been ruined. Even under coach Theodore Whitmore, our home record was intact. We beat the likes of the United States at home, Guatemala. We had a few sneaky draws along the way at home as well, Costa Rica in a few friendly matches. But what has happened under coach Everett has been... It's hard to take in. One can argue, however, one can argue that statistically the team has improved in terms of performances, chance created, passing accuracy more forward passes than side to side than under Alfredo Montesto and Tapa Whitmore. In those instances, one can say, well, Schaefer in for a little bit more time. But the, the World Cup is everyone's ultimate aim. <sighs> if I know a lot who, of persons are going to ask. Uh, sorry, before sorry, I... Who, who do you, who ahead, would you, sorry, yeah. just to say, who, who do you think would be, um, you know, realistic alternatives should Schaefer hypothetically go? Who is the to come in and take the reins for Jamaica? It's a difficult question because you look at the options available. What is the, the budget that we have available? Knowing Captain Borelli, who is going to most likely want to go for an overseas coach, a foreign coach, as, as I like to say in Jamaica, are they going to give John Barnes a second go? He's the only coach that has never lost a match as head coach of Jamaica. Will he get another opportunity? I don't know. Only time will tell. But thinking about, you know, the JFF has been m- murmuring about the budget and paying and salaries and all of that. So it might be just be a local coach for the time period if Schaefer is removed. I honestly don't want an, uh, a Coley, Andre Coley, uh, Miguel Coley, sorry, to be in charge of the national team. I don't. I honestly don't. I would rather keep, keep on Schaefer till the end of the Caribbean Cup or Gold Cup if we qualify. And then we reassess from there. So at this point in time, I am... Schaefer in, surprisingly. Schaefer in or Schaefer out, Santoki? <laughs> <laughs> um, I I agree with Simon. I think rather than firing him instantaneously and getting a stopgap local coach, I think if they're going to if they're going to get rid of him, it's best to at least have him for Caribbean Cup qualifiers and maybe the Gold Cup while they assess and really scout a long term prospect to take over the reins of Jamaica for the next World Cup qualifying campaign. Um, in regards to names that stand out, I can't see John Barnes get in the position just because he hasn't really coached anywhere major in the interim between his last reign for Jamaica and now. So I can't really see them going with John Barnes as good as his record was for Jamaica a few years ago. He won the 2008 Caribbean Cup, didn't he? Yeah. 2008, um, yeah, yeah. In Jamaica, yeah. But, you know... Uh, apart from that, I suppose it was quite a short-lived tenure. Yeah, wasn't um, it about six, seven months, was it? Yeah. 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 yeah something along those lines. Um, I mean, I, I suppose looking at the looking at the qualifying, they were positive. Um, is that Trinidad and Tobago got their point, and they'll be the lone Caribbean representative at the Hex. Mm. So. That's right. Yeah. Good but for before them. we. Yeah, yeah, but before we got into Trinidad, I just want to touch on another point on Jamaica. Well, two points. One, 
the team arrived back into Jamaica yesterday and the Jamaican government had a small reception for West Morgan, which is the first time in Jamaica since winning the Premier League trophy. And the mayor of Kingston gave him a key to the city. I think that's a quite remarkable thing to do. I, I admire and I do think he should be acknowledged for what he has done. But what I did not like was the players, how they viewed it in a way like they go on social media and posting pictures with recording artists and it's like they don't care at all what happened Friday night if you understand what I mean I would have preferred to have them in a despondent mood I know it sounds strange but it just seems that they didn't care about what happened Nathan do you get anything from that? Well I haven't seen that but I can understand why that would frustrate fans um yeah, probably probably not the best thing to do, was it, to to go and do that and then you know put it on social media, especially after just losing. Um, I mean, but in terms of honouring Wes Morgan, um, I think that's a superb, um, you know, it's obviously a superb achievement for him to win the Premier League, and it's great that you know that's being acknowledged back home in Jamaica. Um, yeah, but yeah, in terms of the um, the social media thing, and and, and that'll only annoy fans, won't it? Certainly did. Santoki, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, I haven't seen the social media post myself, but if it is true, then uh, it is certainly adding fuel to the fire and it won't be creating much sympathy from the fans towards the uh, Jamaican players. Uh, absolutely. It was a number of players that were taking pictures and videos with, and on Snapchat and Instagram with recording artists, popcorn and acting like it was all happy days all over again. Not right now, maybe in the next few years. And the final point I will make about Jamaica, the man that I believe locally, who I think will do an excellent job as head coach of Jamaica going into the future, maybe not in next month, maybe not next year or two years, but definitely one for the future is Andrew Edwards. He's a head coach of the Jamaica under-17 national team presently, and I feel that he's one for the future. Very young. He's been to Germany on training as well. He's also been in the classroom alongside the likes of Jurgen Klopp as well. So he's had some valuable training lessons as well while he was away in 2014. So I think he's definitely a one to, to watch. Although his style N- of football took, might not nearly, be the most... Yeah. Nearly, took, um, nearly took the under-17s, didn't he, to the under-17 World Cup as well. That's right. That's right. Clearly yeah, he's a penalty shootout, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, his, his style of football is not the most eye-catching, but it's effective. And I've seen that in the Manning Cup in Jamaica, where local high schools face each other. Won the Ben Francis with St. Elizabeth Technical in 2011, amongst other honours. So we do wish him all the best with the Honour 17 team as they get into action in the next 11 days' time. Let's move on to another Caribbean team, Trinidad and Tobago. Nathan, you're over the moon buzzing about them, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if uh, this only helps my my my, uh, my prediction of them going to Russia, so uh, <laughs> I know you guys will quote me on that forever now. But um, but no, I mean, I thought they're actually they're actually quite sluggish um, at home to to Guatemala in the first half. Um, they couldn't really get going. I was impressed by, with Guatemala. They obviously needed that that they know they knew sorry that they needed to get a win. Um, but Jovin Jones scored a brace. Ultimately, they got the job done. They got that vital point um, that they needed to get in order to get uh, get to the hex, and they'll be the only Caribbean representative in the hexagonal. So the final six teams, and that will kick off in November. Um, yeah, uh, J- uh, John Bostock was actually unavailable. It was ironic because we talked about the, his potential <laughs> influence on the previous show. He was uh, he was ruled out for some reason. The FIFA paperwork has still not been processed. Um, there are still problems lingering there, and he's yet to be capped by Trent Tobago. So um, they're hoping, you know, that he'll he'll eventually make his international bow in November. Um, so they were without him, but I mean, Trent Tobago, they 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 you know they improved in the second half. Um, uh, Jovin Jones' goals were, were were pretty good overall. They scored just on the stroke of half time. It was a great ball from Daniel Cyrus, and then the outside of his boot just after the hour mark. Um, he, he got the goal and uh, Guatemala scored late on as a consolation but and they also went down to 10 men as well um, very cynical foul but um, all in all I think you know they need to be happy that they got the point Kenwin Jones was saying after the game in a, in a press conference that the bigger picture needs to be looked at here and the fact that Trent Tobago um, are in the hexagonal 
is a very significant achievement. Um, and I was speaking to uh, the Soka Warriors website, the forum, and they were telling me that they believe that this is the best Trinidad and Tobago team since 2006 when mm. they got to the Germany finals. Um, albeit, you know, drew one, lost two, but. Um, but they believe that this is the best crop of players, the best generation since 2006. I tend to agree with them. They've got plenty of depth. And also, if you look at the age demographic, a lot of the players, they're ranking at about 25, 26, 27. Um, you know, they're at the peak performance. A lot of them are off the island playing at clubs all over the world, which Shantoki talked about last week. So I think the future is bright for Trent Tobago. And in, and in coach Stephen Hart, he's got a manager there that knows what he's doing. Um, you know, tactically clued up, I think, um, you know, and he's able to adapt um, in, in each game situation. So um, I'm really excited, actually, to see how they do, not only in the hex, but also tomorrow night away to the United States, which I think will be a very fascinating game. Interesting. Santoki, what do you think? Yeah, I think... Um... Any fans who are watching Trinidad and Tobago for the first time against Guatemala wouldn't have seen a true reflection of the talent of Trinidad and Tobago just because it was a very nervy and edgy game based on what was at stake. And you could see it in the play. A lot of passes they couldn't string together. The play was generally sloppy in comparison to the previous games in their group. But ultimately, what's important is they got the result. They grinded it out. They've done what was needed and they've qualified, which Stephen Hart emphasised in the uh, press conferences afterwards so impressive impressive performance to get the point grind it out they held their nerves job done um jovin jones has been really good in the group so far i believe he's the top scorer in the world cup qualifier in this round of the world cup qualifiers four goals i believe which is really good for the left winger and yeah it is a really talented team very exciting to watch and um i can see them troubling a few of the top teams in congo caps such as panama um, Honduras and maybe even the United States which as Nathan said will get a taste of on Tuesday when they face each other Yeah <clears throat> group honours is still there to play for in that group so it'll be interesting to see who will get that top spot you know not many Caribbean teams get that sort of opportunity to finish top of the group you know Jamaica back in 1998 that was the last time they actually as a Caribbean team they topped the group that had 13 points in that one so Trinidad let's see what they can do we do admire what they have done so far as Nathan pointed out last week as well about the depth they have in certain positions like centre half as well it's quite optimistic looking ahead going into the final round as well you look at 10 games they would have to play there's options available for different venues and of course you approach different teams with a different style so it is something to look forward to for Trinidad and we do wish them all the best and I think if you are going to qualify for the World Cup I think 15, 16 points is a good benchmark for Trinidad to set themselves for, to finish in the top three, certainly. They can't lose any at home. I think that is a benchmark they'll have to hope for. But Trinidad's home fans, they're as lively as they are just for any other sport. So we do wish them all the best where that is concerned. Nathan, do you think that points target is, is, is good to, to reach, 15, 16? For the hexagonal, sorry. For, yes, for the hexagonal, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'd say so, based, based on, on past history. Um, I mean, y your point there is spot on about making your, your home ground a fortress. You really can't afford to lose uh, on home soil. Um, and then you've got to hope, you know, to take, uh, you know, bits and pieces when you go away on the road. Um, but, I mean, if, if they can get, yeah, in the region of kind of 15 to 18 points, that should, you would think, put them in the top three. But, of course, there is always that fourth place option, which, which gives you the playoff against the AFC team from Asia. Um, that's how they qualified back in 2006, a uh, two-legged playoff against Bahrain. So there is that option, but ideally, you know, you'd, you'd want to try and get an automatic berth. Um, I mean, I think, I, as I say, I think Stephen Hart knows what he's doing, um, and, you know, he'll probably prepare, prepare the players a little bit differently for the Hex. Because if you look at the way, that, in, way in which they've conducted themselves and their approaches to matches in the, this round, in round four... Um, they've generally been quite open. They've generally, you know, attacked on the front foot. They've pressed high. I think in the hex, you're going to see a slightly different Trimbagonian setup, whereby, um, you know, they'll, they'll maybe be a little bit more defensive and sit a little bit deeper because they know that they'll be playing teams like Mexico and the United States that will 
inevitably have more of the ball. But the good thing with Trent Tobago is that, and, and Hart will know this, that they've got plenty of pace going forward. The likes of Molino, Cato, Jovin Jones has been sensational on the left wing. And then, of course, you've got the focal point, Kenwin Jones, who can, can knit the play together and bring everybody in. So, um, you know, it's a flexible team looking at, that, looking at tactics. Uh, but, yes, yeah, certainly going back to your point, 15 to 16 points, that would be um, a very, very, very satisfying record. It should see them... Um, progress and I think the appetite is really there now for a, for a Caribbean team to make it back to the World Cup <laughs> Agreed there Before we touch on to St Vincent and the Grenadines, Nathan please give me your prediction for the Trinidad Clash on Tuesday against the Americans I think it's going to finish 1-1 I think it's going to finish 1-1 and that would mean that Trent Tobago would top the group on 12 points that's just my opinion Santoki, your prediction? I think uh, USA are going to edge it 2-0 Mainly because I feel like Trinidad will rest a lot of players and not want to play all their cards out as they will be playing USA again in a few months' time in the hexagonal. So they won't want to show all their cards. So I believe they'll rest a few players and USA will grind the victory up 2-0 at home. Hmm, interesting. I'm going to make it a more open game. I'll, I'll say 2-2 draw on this occasion. St. Vincent and the Grenadines. What a story it has been for them. Nathan, what happened against the Americans for, for the Vinci Heat team? Did they not show up to the party? What happened? Um, they just weren't good enough, basically. Um, <laughs> it's as simple as that. The, the, the golf in, in class was there for everyone to see. And myself and Santoki actually watched and co- co-commentated on this game for uh, online for Rabble TV. Um, and we, we both kind of agreed at full time that, you know, it's a spirited performance, sp- particularly in the, the first 20, 25 minutes from, from Vinci Heat. But um, as soon as USA got that first goal from Bobby Wood, the floodgates opened, Bezler with a second, then they gave away a terrible penalty. Roy Richards basically fly-kicked uh, the American forward, and Altidor scored the penalty. At that point, half-time, 3-0 up, um, it's pretty much game over. The teenager, Christian Pulisic, came on for the USA in the second half, and he looked very, very good indeed. He bagged himself two goals and an assist. Um, and ultimately, you know, Vinci Heat, they, they just, they didn't create enough clear-cut chances. Um, towards the end of the match, you know, it looked a bit like a training session. Um, it was attack against defence. There was so much open space. That was very, very obvious. Um, and, and, yeah, and they were kind of just walking towards the end. Um, and we, we've known about that. We talked about the lack of fitness that they've shown in previous outings. Um, and and that, was, that was there for everyone to see again. Um, but, you know, fair play to them. They did well to get this far, albeit in fortunate circumstances, you could argue. Um, but they've, they've really got to try and take the positives. You've got to stress upon the positives. I think that, um, you know, at the moment, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of negatives and, and the, the coach was, I think, Cornelius Huggins was, was fired. Um, but, you know, they've got some good individual players, the likes of Myron Samuel, Oleg Anderson. Uh, Tevin Slater, it shouldn't be too long until he gets off the island and gets a professional contract. They have got some good players, um, but looking forward now, I think they've just got to try to take the positives, uh, try and learn from, from the defeats. I mean, yes, they've had some heavy defeats, but, um, you know, for, for, for the Caribbean Cup qualifiers in, in a couple of years. Um, but, yeah, they've got to look back on this campaign, I think, in, you know, trying to, trying to take some, some plus points instead of stressing on the negatives, I would say. Yeah, I do hope they look at it in a situation where it's a learning experience for them and not like yeah. just a cycle that they have to ignore. There are positives to take from this campaign, but there are also some things that they can work on as well. And individual, I do hope that the pitches on in the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines can be able to improve because that's the way we're going to see better quality football. And hopefully CONCACAF and FIFA has more training programs, grassroots incentives so that the sport can be developed there. Santoki, I know you're quite vivid about this last week because that, that Vinci heat spot could have easily been Guyana, couldn't it have been? Yeah, could have uh, very easily been a uh, Guyana spot. I mean, it was a tight game. They defeated Guyana 6-6 and they came through on away goals. There was a big appeal about an ineligible player, Gavin James, who played in this game incidentally. And then when they did later play, they were set to play Barbados. Barbados were thrown out of the competition and they played Aruba, who some would say a lesser team than Barbados so you could say they had a lucky route to the group stages but as you say there are positives to take from this 
they they managed to play six games against top teams in the region and it will be a learning experience for a lot of players who are semi-professional. I think what the problem was, having watched the game against USA where they lost 6-0, was mental concentration. So in the first half, they conceded three goals towards the end of the first half. And then in the second half, towards the end of the second half, they conceded three goals. So it was just that mental concentration at the end of each half. And it could also be down to lack of physical stamina, as a lot of them are semi-professional and aren't used to training every day in that type of environment. So again, it is a learning curve, but there are hopefully opportunities for players to use this and get professional contracts aboard. Players such as Tevin Slater, who's shown his exciting and electric pace throughout the group games. Um, interestingly enough, all the games in St. Vincent have to be played in the daytime because they don't have lights for their stadium. So hopefully they can use the money earned from this group stage as long with FIFA funding to get some lights and build a great evening atmosphere for the team and make it their home ground on as well a, a type of fortress, as we were alluding to earlier, for other Caribbean <laughs> teams to do as well. <laughs> Absolutely, or maybe even get a new stadium because Arnesville, as you know, is used for cricket. So you never yeah. know what the future can bring. You know, teams can use their funding well and not in a way where there's greed among administration. You never know what can happen in football. We've seen what has happened with the Sugar Boys of St. Kitts and Nevis and the progress they've made. You know, you never know what can happen. So Santoki, give me your prediction for Guatemala versus St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, I think it will be... 6-0 to Guatemala. Ooh, that much. Ooh. <laughs> Colossal, isn't it? Nathan, what do you think? Ooh. I'm going to be a little bit kinder. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go 3-1. 3-1. And Ooh. I think the centre-half, Francis, is going to score a bullet header from a corner. <laughs> and St. Vincent and the Grenadines <laughs> are going to come home from Guatemala City with a 3-1 defeat which will be considerably less emphatic than their previous results. Come on, Vincey Hee. <laughs> I love Simon, your specific vision? predictions. <laughs> I, love, I, I love specific predictions. I'm going to go 4-2 <laughs> for, four, two for Guatemala on this occasion. So what about Jamaica versus Haiti now, guys? Nathan, how about that prediction? Uh, Jamaica against Haiti. Um, I think Jamaica are going to win this. I do. Um, not it will mean anything with both both teams being mathematically eliminated um, but I think they'll get back to winning ways at Independence Park 1-0 um, because Haiti are, are quite a boring team to watch I'm sorry to say that <laughs> but since Patrice Navu has come in um, you know I, I caught a bit of their game against Costa Rica and I was, I was trying very hard not to go to sleep um, so yeah I think Jamaica are going to win that 1-0 and uh, Giles Barnes is going to score very specific I know but um, I think Jamaica will win <laughs> That'll take them up to seven points, but just not enough for them to, to advance um, already out, of course. Right. So, Antoki, how about you? I'm going to go for a nil-nil. They played ten games between them and only managed to score two goals. Haiti haven't scored so far in the groups, and Jamaica have struggled to score. So, I'm thinking realistically it'll be a nil-nil. <laughs> Something very bold for me. Jamaica's going to score two goals at home for the first time in a while <laughs> since September last year. Oh, I'm going to go bold. with... Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna very, go, very bold. Yeah. 2-1. Yeah. I'm going to go. Omar Holness with a bullet free kick from 35 yards out and an Adrian Mariapa header from uh, Rudolf Austin Cross into the box. Wow. He even Lovely. predicted the goal scores. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Omar Holness. Are you going to yeah, even... go into the game, Simon? I'm still thinking about it. I mean, I am able to, to get tickets, but I'm still thinking about it. I'm not sure. Of course, the stadium is not going to be packed, as I've explained to you guys last week as well. When, when there's nothing in it, fans are not going to go. And especially when you look at the ticket prices, people are very frustrated about that as well. When you're paying upwards of 5,500 Jamaican, we're talking roughly 45 to 50 pounds. It's crazy, you know? Mm. Yeah, we do it, it hope seem, in the future, yeah. It seems ridiculous. And, you know, some of that cost has to offset the rent of this of Independence Park Limited for the stadium, which is upwards of a million Jamaicans. So call it a shade over £10,000 or so to rent the stadium. So it's quite costly, but I do hope in the future, for future qualifiers, something can be made. Because a four-year-old boy, in my opinion, should not pay the same price as an adult, if you understand what I mean. Mm. No, I agree. Wholeheartedly agree on that. 
<laughs> it's, it's it's silly. Yeah. Uh, you know. Santoki, what do you think? Yeah, I think there should be a separate price. I mean, in England, you generally have separate prices for under 18s, and even 18s to 21s get student prices. So hmm. I agree. It's, uh, to encourage the future generations to be involved in yeah. football, they should always. Oh. Uh, all kids for a quid. Sorry to interrupt you, Santoki. All kids yeah. for a quid, which is is popular here in mm-hmm. the UK. Really? Is that done like at the Premier League clubs or like at the football league club level? Yeah, yeah, we have it at West Brom quite a lot. We have kids for a quid. I think that's just because no one wants to come and watch us. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, you have a good it's, team. It's a popular initiative. Oh, don't send me down that road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we do hope that that sort of initiative can be played in the future and the likes of West Brom and Tottenham can take Jamaican international players in the future. We do hope. <laughs> we live in a wishful world, don't we? Or Caribbean for that matter. <laughs> Car- yeah, Caribbean for that matter, yes. Just my little bias there with Jamaica, but yes. Well, that basically wraps up our discussion for today. We, it was quite a handful of topics that we did go through. World Cup qualifying, Cuba, we wish them all the best in the FIFA Futsal tournament as well. The CFU Under-17 uh, final round is going to take place in another 10 days' time or so. That should be quite interesting. Santoki, Nathan, anything you'd like, guys would like to say before we head off? I know there are some things you'd like to get off your chest, starting with Nathan. Is there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it won't, the last, what was that? The sorry? last episode for the season. <laughs> Oh, of course. Sorry. Yeah. So this is yes. silly me. This is the last episode of the season. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed this. Um, I mean, it, it seems to me anyway that this has gone very, very quickly. Um, you know, it's bizarre that we, we only started this in July, but thoroughly enjoyed every minute. I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, you guys listening are enjoying this, whether, you know, you're listening on the go or, um, or you know, you're sitting down and you're really, you're really dedicating yourself. But, you know, we're, we're, we're trying our best to bring you as much information as possible. Um, as much debate as possible so um, I really enjoyed it I just want to say um, that uh, while we've been on air the last couple of minutes um, for those listeners that aren't aware we have set up a GoFundMe page um, uh, called Caribbean Football Weekly Donations because we are looking to get money to be professional enough to be on uh, on SoundCloud Um, and Jason Lawrence who is um, AthloneRB on Twitter I think that's correct yeah, at Athlone RB. It's very, very, very kindly within the last few minutes, I can see here on the on the GoFundMe page, donated £55 to our GoFundMe wow. page. So he is just single hand. He's pretty much paid for our, along with wow. s- several other donations from um, myself, uh, my mum, <laughs> um, my cousin, <laughs> and Santoki. Uh, Jason Lawrence has just paid uh, £55. Um, we we honestly can't thank everyone enough for their donations, particularly Jason, because that is that's quite incredible. So thank you very much, and we look forward to we we very much look forward to uh, to going on SoundCloud and, and bringing you uh, professional content from from now on in. Wow, that is truly something. Thank you very much, Jason. We really appreciate it. Athlone, as he is known on the Reggae Boys forum, know him quite well, quite vocal character as well, and quite a nice fellow as well. Santoki, anything you'd like to add? No, just uh, thank you very much to Jason for that amazing donation. Yeah, quite taken aback by that. Yeah, <laughs> we've 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 left. It's not a mistake, yeah. is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is good news, and it's some. It shows that we're doing something right, and it's something going in the right direction. Now, this hiatus is not quite long. We'll be back, but we'll be be back in two weeks' time or so. We'll definitely keep you all posted on social media. So don't forget fans as well to go on the Reggae Boys commentary YouTube page to see in the playlist section so you can catch up on the previous eight episodes of Caribbean Football Weekly. We have switched to the podcast format due to technical reasons. And please do catch up on all 10 episodes. My co-presenters, Santoki and Nathan, have been quite brilliant in their expertise on Caribbean aspects. And we do want to keep, have them on going into season two as well. We also are going to try to get on some professionals as well, whether it is professional footballers or administrators as well as guests. We'll see what has happened, what happens in the future. Anything can happen. Gentlemen, any last words? Nathan? Uh, no, look forward to the qualifiers tomorrow. Um, be, be, I'll be trying to, trying to follow as much as possible. 
So you can just check me out on Twitter if you haven't already at Caribbean Football uh, FTBL. And thank you very much for listening once again. All right. Sounds okay how about you? Yeah, I just want to say thoroughly enjoyed being part of the show. Really enjoyed engaging with fans who have sent comments, questions, feedback about the show. And it's really good to get publicity out for Caribbean football, which is a region of the world which doesn't get as much coverage as it should do, in my opinion. Absolutely spot on there. 100% agreed. Nathan Santoki, thank you very much once again for your time. I'm Simon Preston here with the Caribbean Football Weekly. Tune in again with us in two weeks' time. Take care for now. Bye.